In this week's episode of Non-Native Creative, I had a great time speaking with Max Frenzel, AI researcher and co-author of the new book, Time Off, a practical guide to building your rest ethic and finding success without the stress, released last week. Max is originally from a small town in Germany, but his studies have taken him to London, Greece, and Japan. Throughout his studies, he's had opportunities to travel, and these have given him chances to reflect. Through these experiences, he's realized that just because he's busy doesn't always mean he's being productive. Time Off introduces a variety of different ways of spending your leisure time, and it introduces these along with a discussion of the creative process. I asked Max about how to find time for yourself, even if you're a stressed out student or a busy parent. So I hope that this discussion gives you some ideas and inspires you to find new or different ways of spending your leisure time. Make sure to check out the Project Patreon for a transcript of this discussion and take a look at the links in the description to see where you can find Max's book and find Max on social media. Enjoy! On this week's episode of Non-Native Creative, I'm very excited to welcome Max Frenzel to the show. Thank you very much for joining me this week. I'm very excited to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, Max is the co-author of a new book that has just launched a few days ago uh, called Time Off. It's all about uh, kind of this idea of taking time off in a rather noble way, to use uh, some of the expressions from the book. Uh, we're going to talk about that and also the road that brought him to where he is uh, now. Uh, of course, we're both actually in Tokyo at the moment, uh, but discussing things online due to the current world situation. So I want to kick things off with the same question that I ask everybody uh, at the beginning to these discussions, which I borrow from superhero stories. Uh, if you could, could you please share, if you have one, what you might call your origin story, the experience or uh, the thing that you encountered somewhere in your life that kind of kicked off uh, the, your drive to where you are today. Do you have something that's kind of an origin story for you? It's so difficult because I don't really know what the path I'm currently on is. It's just so many <laughs> random things. Okay. I think that's actually part of what got me to where I am, all those little random things. So I grew up in Germany in a tiny village. Mm -hmm. um, then after high school, I moved to the UK, to London to do my, well, then study physics and then later do my PhD there in physics. I stayed mm -hmm. in London for seven years. Mm -hmm. During that time, through random circumstances, more or less, I also ended up in Japan for a while. Okay. Um, that got me back here to Japan eventually after my PhD when I started doing AI research in startups. Okay. So I did my PhD, but I kind of was a bit bored. Well, not bored of academia, but I wanted to use my well, math skills to actually solve some real world problems. And AI seemed like the right thing to do. Okay. And... I really enjoyed initially AI research and I enjoyed working in startups, but after a while I realized I was getting busier and busier without actually feeling productive. So maybe back to my PhD days, I felt extremely, well, I had so much freedom. I was extremely lucky with the people I was working with and the group mm -hmm. I was working in. I could really disappear for months without even anyone asking or me asking anyone. Wow. Like, I spent a year here in Japan and the administration in London had no idea that I was gone. I mean, my team and my professors knew, but Whoa. the admin people had no idea I was here. Is that so even really that an a, issue? Not really. I mean, not for my group. They mm -hmm. knew I was still doing physics and yeah, it, wow. it was great. And I had all this freedom. Sometimes I just didn't work for weeks. And then I knew when I came back, suddenly I had so many ideas in my research and I got so much done. So I had experienced how much you can do if you take time off seriously and if you really practice that. But then once I was in that startup world, I just slowly, busyness kept creeping up on me. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, do you know the Seishun Chuhachikipu? Yes. It's this ticket for local trains and it's wonderful i mean it, it's really made for slow traveling mm. it's very cheap but you can only use the slow trains and i was using that for i think a week to travel around tohoku the northern part of the main island here yeah and i was sitting in a tiny ryokan in the middle of nowhere um just looking out the window at this beautiful mountain somewhere in yamagata and it really hit me that moment that never in my life had i felt more busy and at the same time, less productive and creative than then. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started writing about these things, mainly to just process the ideas for myself to mm -hmm. like, why, what went wrong? Like, why mm -hmm. is this freedom and this kind of creativity not my reality anymore? Like, yeah. what happened then? Initially, only friends read my articles. But over time, actually, I was really lucky. I can't remember who it was, but some fairly popular 
person on Medium picked it up and shared it and suddenly had thousands of readers. Cool. And yeah, it was really unexpected and really nice. I just kept writing about that topic. Okay. And my now co-author, John, who's based in Austin, Texas, he mm -hmm. was doing a podcast at the time on the same topic. So it was called Time Off, the podcast, and it still ah, exists. Ah, I see. How did the and two of you get connected? Maybe. Yeah, he found my article on Medium. Okay. And then he reached out to me saying, hey, do you want to be on this podcast and talk about it? I see. And I joined him. We became friends from that. And a couple of months later, I had an email in my inbox saying, hey, do you want to write a book together? Cool. <laughs> and that's how that whole thing started. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy, actually. To this day, we have never met in person. He's based Whoa. in Austin, Texas. I'm based in Tokyo. And yeah. We have not met in person yet, but over a year and a half, we wrote a book together. And I know him better than some of my close friends I see almost every week. Wow. So that's really that's interesting, kind of actually. Like that kind of large. the digital collaboration that is now possible today. Totally. That is it's very, so wonderful. very cool. Right? Right? Technology I'm can be difficult if you use it wrong but it's also like if you use it right it can enable so many amazing things i think that you and you also have to have the right people <laughs> to work mm. with with you totally. know in that capacity because sometimes it's very hard like someone who's not used to using technology in that way it can be a bit tricky to to coordinate when you have Absolutely. to play like you know it help desk at the same time <laughs> No, no, anyway. I was very fortunate with that. <laughs> That's good. That's really, really cool. I have, I, I just want to go back um, to one small point, maybe not, well, sure. not really a small point in your story. You said through kind of like a series of random events, you came to Japan. Oh, absolutely. What, what, what was maybe one or two of those like random events? Why Japan of all the countries that you could have chosen? I think the most decisive random event was an email I found in my inbox when I was doing my PhD in London. Mm -hmm. uh, it was basically saying, hey, there's this three month uh, research position at Tokyo University. Uh -huh. I thought, hmm, Tokyo sounds cool. Why not? So I applied for it. I got it and I came here. Yeah. But maybe I should say I had some interest in Japan at the time already. Like uh -huh. I was doing martial arts for many years. I was actually doing kendo at my university in London. Okay. I was team captain of our kendo club there. Mm -hmm. So I did have some exposure. Um, it wasn't just completely random there. Right. But it was an email that kicked it off. And actually during those three months at Tokyo University, um, I absolutely fell in love with Tokyo, mm -hmm. even though I didn't actually enjoy Tokyo University that much, to be honest. I mean, the people I was working with were super nice, but mm -hmm. academia here in Japan is very, very different from academia, well, yes. anywhere else in the world. But yes. I mean, I already talked about my experience in London, kind of. My, my professors were good buddies of mine. Like, they were not, mm -hmm. I mean, sure, they were my supervisors, but they were also just good buddies. Mm -hmm. And especially if you talk about science and if you talk about physics, anyone who has a good idea is right or like you just judged by your ideas and you tell if your professor is wrong you tell him you're an idiot that's just bullshit what you're talking about mm -hmm. in japan no one would ever like mm. say no to their professor even if everyone in the room knows they're wrong and it's just this kind of like hierarchy and again it comes back to creativity like there's just so many mm, yeah it's very difficult to be creative in academic research here I would agree with that assessment. Uh, I too was at uh, Tokyo University mm. for four years. Uh, I was also, I guess we were probably in the same department, the Graduate School of Engineering, but I was oh, yeah. there in a staff capacity. I was working uh, doing translations and uh, like helping an international uh, architecture laboratory uh, that was doing um, kind of like this very, I guess you could call it like theoretical work, <laughs> like material no. research and so on. And the environment, yes, was, that, that was kind of the impression that I got, especially in mm. uh, Tokyo University, which is Japan's, regarded as Japan's top university. Yeah. There's kind of this, um, a little bit, I would actually, I shouldn't say a little bit, but definitely like, because <laughs> it's the top university, it's mm. difficult, if not impossible, uh, to challenge things there. It's, it's, totally. it's very, very yeah. uh, rule-based, I would yeah. say, uh, which is for sure a good, I think it was good to experience. I mean, mm. at least that's my takeaway from it. Perhaps that's yeah. yours as well. It was a good experience yeah, to have. Mm, like you learn a lot from yeah. that experience, but it's, I think, maybe challenging to imagine yourself being in that for a long time. Yeah. I, I think see. that what's weird about Japanese academia as well is there is some really, really good research happening in Japan, but some of it doesn't even make it to the outside world because the Japanese researchers are extremely bad at 
A, presenting their research to the rest of the world and B, also just communicating and collaborating internationally. Mm -hmm. So there's this really kind of closed off system happening here and the rest of the world just doesn't really know about it, doesn't interact with those people. I found that's that how as well. Science works, right? I found mm -hmm. that as well, that just like the simple, uh, the simple act of uh, preparing a presentation is quite different no. uh, in Japan as opposed to, I should say, English speaking countries no. uh, to the best of my knowledge. So that was a challenge that I had. Uh, I was also uh, found that the simple, um, practice of properly citing <laughs> things, mm. uh, of referring to sources and documenting these things. There's not really um, a, a cohesive guide for that in no. Japan, um, at least that I could find. So that was no. another challenge that I was trying to, I, I personally as well would uh, had those challenges. Um, I guess if you were working on the translations, you were literally in that gap kind of trying to bridge that, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, between international students and uh, Japanese university and mm. also between uh, Japanese university professors and uh, outside world. So they were preparing right. articles for the outside world. And so those kinds yep. of uh, challenges were absolutely present. I had that experience as well. Mm. Uh, but I mean, to get to go more towards specifically your work, while well, this is a very, I could talk a lot about this and I'm sure you could too from your experiences. Uh, you met, so you said after um, this experience in Tokyo University or maybe during at the same time was when you began traveling and kind of thinking and writing mm. and giving yourself these opportunities to kind of reflect on your experiences a little bit more. So was this, this it was after this uh, experience at Tokyo University uh, that you that you started doing that was that is that correct yeah so basically um, I mean I did the three month period that was the first time that got me to Japan which was still very early in my PhD um, it might have been the first year of my PhD okay. and as I said I totally fell in love with Tokyo even though Tokyo University wasn't that great but I applied for another one year fellowship at Tokyo University anyway okay. because I wanted to come back and you might know JSPS they're the ones yep. who awarded me the fellowship and yep. I came back for one more year towards the end of my PhD. And so the thing was, basically, I had enough research done already for my PhDs and my professors were cool with that. So they said, yeah, sure, go and do whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I ended up doing. Uh, I came <laughs> I to Japan with government money. Maybe I shouldn't say this publicly, but <laughs> we not, it much, out. We'll edit it out. <laughs> not much research. I mean, I did get some research done, but I just had an amazing year here in Tokyo. Uh -huh. I mean, Probably a lot of people you speak to, they all know this. That's kind of the first year or so you come to Japan. It's a very special time. It's kind of honeymoon phase. And I made full use of that, being paid on government money and essentially having no deadlines or anything. Or mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was a great time. Oh, that's awesome. That, yeah, I went back to the UK just to submit my thesis, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And in between, actually, I spent three months on a Greek island writing my thesis. Okay. So I rented a little house on that island. And I got so much stuff done in that time as well, like, I don't know, I was writing two or three hours a day. Um, the rest of the time was just spent swimming or exploring the island or whatever. Um, but again, I got so much stuff done. And in mm -hmm. six weeks, I had my thesis written from first word to fully completed thing. And it was a very enjoyable experience, actually. Wow, six weeks. That's that's quick. Having helped yeah. someone prepare a thesis that took a year. <laughs> PhD thesis Most took a people... Year. I can't imagine doing that in six weeks. Right. But I think a lot of people, because they're so kind of, I don't know, spending all their time in the library or like really too, too much focus and not using that time away from things. I think that's really what helped me to do it because mm -hmm. I approached it in such a stress-free way in a completely different environment. And I think that's really what made, me, what made it so easy and enjoyable as well. So that was a conscious choice. Like you said to yourself, absolutely, okay, absolutely. I'm going to make, I'm going to write my PhD yeah. in this setting. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, I was living in London. Um, there's a lot of distractions in London. And I thought, okay, let's try and go as remote and as kind of nice or, yeah, leisurely as possible while still mm -hmm. having a good internet connection. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in the mountains on this tiny Greek island. And I mean, the nearest village I had to walk, I think, half an hour. I had a scooter so I could like write that in like, I don't know, five, ten minutes to the village mm -hmm. as well. But, but there was nothing around me. I had good internet connection. That was the only thing I needed. But mm -hmm. otherwise, it was very, very remote and solitary three months. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, I, I'm kind of starting to see then the natural progression of how this led to yeah, there is definitely a little <laughs> your, book, <path> there. <laughs> your book project then. Yeah, now I'm kind of starting to see it all come together. I see. So once you finish your PhD, obviously now you're back in Japan. Uh, but so you moved, you moved from physics research into kind of this, now the work that you're doing is like kind yep. of AI and its relationship to, to human behavior and, and to design and like uh, artistic yeah. pursuits as well. Mm. I mean, initially it was different. Um, during my PhD, even 
as I said, I had a lot of freedom. So even during that time, I started a company with a few other people. It was basically a smart cooking app. Um, so I had some startup experience already. And towards the end of my PhD, I was just approached by a company here doing AI research, but for very commercial applications. So I was working with financial institutions, for example, um, to do news analysis for their financial analysts. Like, can we use AI to get quicker information from news? And well, I joined them after I submitted my thesis. Um, and I worked there for, I think, two years or so. About one year into that, that's when I had this experience that, wait, something's wrong. I'm busy all the time, but mm -hmm. I'm not feeling productive. And initially, I really thought, oh, I can change the company culture and I can, I, I can make this better. But after a year or so of banging my head against this and... I mean, it's really a leadership question. Um, I just realized the leadership there did not agree with the ideas I had. And mm -hmm. um, it would be a wasted effort for me trying to change that. I see. So was and this a, uh, maybe I missed it, sorry. Was this, was this a Japanese company? It's a Japanese startup, but also, well, there was also a lot of foreign involvement. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the, I think the team was maybe, well, basically all the salespeople were Japanese and all the non-sales people were foreigners, international. Okay. And I joined the team when it was, I think, around 20 people. By the time I left two years later, we were, I think, around 60 to 80 people. So wow. I saw it grow from mm -hmm. very small to sort of mid, well, large size startup, really. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So you were extremely busy in this point in time. Yeah, and just very felt unproductive, uncreative. And there were also other things with the company culture that I didn't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. And eventually I decided, okay, maybe it's time to look for something else. And I've been interested in creative applications for a long time. So I've been into music for a very long time. Um, I've been doing other creative things. I used to direct music videos during universities, like film and edit and everything. Um, mm -hmm. So I had quite a bit of well, creative and design experience in a way. And a friend of mine here, he'd been talking to me for a long time. I mean, he did a company now 12 years old so it's not really a startup anymore but it's only like six seven people mm -hmm. it's really a creative studio focusing on computational creativity he's also okay. a professor at Keio University actually running a computational creativity lab there mm -hmm. um, and he'd been asking me for a long time hey Max don't you want to join me don't you want to join me don't you want to join me and at that point I thought okay now is the time yes I'm ready to join and make kind of AI and creativity mm -hmm. my full-time job okay and I joined them in February last year okay and yeah it's been a wonderful time although I actually just decided to again move on to the next thing I'll still stay involved with them but mm -hmm. more on a creative and kind of advisory role sure. still working on the art projects but from next week Monday actually so probably by the time this is released I'm taking a new role as R&D lead at a company making uh, chatbots for travel and emergency response so people so have been chat? in chatbots Chatbots. Ah, yep. okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So one of the big clients, for example, is Narita Airport. If you traveled over the last year or so, you might have even interacted with that system because, for example, if you use the Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. immediately afterwards, this chatbot comes up and basically tries to help you, hey, find your flight and you can just interact I with see. it. What's the easiest way to get into the city? Where can I buy this and this? Mm -hmm. And that's going to cool. be exciting. It's also an exciting time to join. Um, I mean, the travel industry is down a lot, but there's also the other yeah. aspect of crisis management right now, especially sure. Corona information. So sure. it's an interesting and like, challenge. To go back as well, I think maybe just uh, for viewers and listeners, the, the oh. topic of like, what is computational creativity? What is computational anything? It's like the use of right. you know, data, computers and computation in order to create something. Yeah. Uh, so this is, I mean, one avenue, obviously the use of travel uh, to do that. But I think that we're also starting to see, at least at the time of recording this, you know, other uses of, uh, of this coming into play in many countries. Like for example, uh, an app that's going to like, you know, do contact tracing work for us, something mm. like that. So, I think that that's a really interesting uh, field to be in at this point in time in particular. Definitely. But I can also see how, like, through the progression of your story, yeah. you're probably involved in a lot of different things and going, oh, my gosh, like, maybe what, what am I getting done here? So that kind of led to, I guess, perhaps now we're in that period where you described, you know, we're kind of doing some writing and pushing on medium perhaps no. and now obviously you have this book uh, that uh, was exactly. just released on May 25th is that right Monday yep, that's correct uh, yeah uh, we've, we spoke a little bit before we began recording I'm in the process of reading it right now it is awesome. uh, it's called time off 
Uh, but it's not, at least in my, uh, thus far in my reading, I feel like it's not just about time off. It's also, uh, it's kind of, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion intertwined uh, about creativity and kind of the creative process is kind of my impression. But if you were kind of to summarize or to, to introduce the book, how would you, how would you explain it to somebody? Yeah, I think your interpretation of this is really good because, yes, it's called Time Off, but it's not a book about being lazy or just lying on the beach with a cocktail. I mean, that is a little part of it, and it's great to do that from time to time, but it's only a small aspect of it. So really, the book is about the many different uses or many different types of time off. Mm -hmm. And we've got different chapters on different types of time off. So it can be travel, it can be solitude, sleep, play, exercise, and even creativity. Mm -hmm. And... Also, in between those uh, chapters, we have many profiles of people who found success with that particular form of time off. So we really want to highlight people and all sorts of different people, historic and present, as well as leaders of the largest companies in the world, down to random people somewhere in the middle of the corporate hierarchy, and really show that time off, you, you can't just be successful in spite of taking time off, but because of it, you can actually use it as a tool. Mm -hmm. And especially in creative work and for knowledge workers, it's a really, really important tool. Mm -hmm. So maybe to your point as well, that time off is not just, well, time off or rest. Um, one of the profiles very early, actually it's the first profile in the book is Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And he talked about this concept of noble leisure. So to him, uh, rest was not the same as leisure because rest always ask the question, rest for what? And usually the answer is, well, rest to do more work. And in the same way for him, work was just there to support leisure. Um, but leisure really stood at the top of this hierarchy. And what he called noble leisure is really anything that fills your life with meaning. Mm -hmm. So that can even be stuff that looks like, well, work to a lot of people. I mean, especially for creatives, a lot of what really fills them with meaning to other people looks like a lot of work. And it might even sure. feel at times to them like a lot of work. I mean, writing the book for me, it was a ton of work, but at the mm -hmm. same time, it's probably the most meaningful thing I've ever done. And in a lot of ways, yes, I put effort into it, but it also really energized me in a way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure you've so. that with a lot of people. Actually, I'm very curious. You've interviewed so many creatives. Yes. Do you see patterns there around this? Absolutely. Use of as I was, uh, as I was, as I've been reading through your book, uh, of course, I've been, you know, I've been considering how, you know, this is perhaps there are many people out there who kind of do this sort of thing intuitively. Like I mm. personally, that's something that I just learned to do. I uh, have, you know, a couple of different things that just kind of feed off each other. But for listeners and viewers of the series, yeah, there's a guy, uh, his name is Jan Branowski. Hi, Jan, if you're watching. Uh, he did the uh, logo design. He is an architect that actually I met at uh, Tokyo University uh, from the Czech Republic. He spoke about it actually in his uh, interview, uh, kind of this, this feedback loop between architecture, design, mm. and photography, and how like when he felt stressed out with architecture, he would go out in the streets and like photograph things. And like that became kind mm. of like a, a way for him to one, like release stress, but also mm to um, kind of force himself to, to look at the city in a different way. And then yeah. the process of sharing that also helped him like kind of network and uh, find these new connections. Um, so, I mean, I thought that that was a really, really clear example uh, of a person yeah, from the series that has kind of exemplified some of the things mm. that are described in the book. Um, and yeah, I, I read that, that part, you start with Aristotle uh, and then you kind of move along to other historical figures. Uh, and again, having, I haven't finished the book because it's only been out a couple of days, <laughs> uh, but uh, I was wondering as I was reading, how did you choose uh, the, the people for the book? Because I was, I was thinking, okay, mm. like we kind of, you began with Aristotle, like uh, you've got, uh, thus far you've, you've got uh, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, you've got Ariana Huffington, you talk about Henry Ford, like, you know, you're not sticking to one uh, category of busy person, yeah. really. Yeah. But how did you choose the people to, to profile in the book? I mean, one thing you just mentioned that was really important to us, we didn't want to highlight just one person because we really think anyone 
can use more time off and it will look very different for everyone as well like that's Mm -hmm. one key thing about time off there is no one size fits all approach we just want to present people with as many different examples as possible Mm -hmm. and as many different ideas and relatable stories and they can then pick and choose their favorites try everything ideally but not everything is going to work for everyone some of the things are even contradictory in the book like i mean some people find time off in solitude others uh much like enjoy much more with friends and Ah. the same like with work and rest and it's really about finding your own style and finding your own balance of things Mm -hmm. and initially we actually had um quite a different plan for the book so i don't know if you know the book i think it's called daily rituals i can't remember who wrote it it's basically a collection of very short well descriptions of famous people's daily habits daily rituals okay and we were thinking of doing something similar just around the idea of time off and we're actually thinking of a kind of biblical approach in a way sort of old testament new testament so first half of the book historic people Uh, uh, second half of the book modern people still living people interesting and both john and i we've worked a lot in well software so we're very comfortable with prototyping and getting Uh test testers in so we wrote just a bunch of profiles and then get it got it into the hands of test readers and they all really loved the idea but they said they want a bit more kind of backbone a bit more depth Mm -hmm. so that's how those deep dive chapters started and now i mean really the focus is the deep dives those those are the Mm -hmm. parts that really explain to you the concepts and then the profiles are just there to give the very relatable stories and also the very um kind of practical advice that anyone can apply um i see Yeah, we just started picking out a lot of different people that came to mind. And then sort of over time, this the whole bigger narrative evolved from that. Got it. That's kind of how the structure, the larger structure of the book came about. So, I mean, in the middle are those deep dives on the different topics. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, first, there is a history description discussion basically how did we actually end up forgetting the value of leisure Mm -hmm. because if you look at ancient greece and rome aristotle's time they valued leisure above anything else like if you didn't have time off you were not successful if you were busy you were not successful Mm -hmm. but then somehow along the way through various influences we discussed them um, somehow we ended up forgetting the value of that and not just forgetting we basically flipped it around now people pride themselves in busyness and Basically, they need this busyness to feel accomplished. Yeah, I've noticed like now it's become a greeting uh, when people say, hey, how are you? They go, oh, busy. It's like, if that's not your totally. answer, no, that's like, Absolutely. you're not going to look so good. Yeah. And it's kind of this almost boasting disguised as a complaint, but mm-hmm. it's really like, oh, look at me, I'm busy. The humble I'm brag. Busy. Exactly. <laughs> totally. It totally is. It totally yeah. is. But this actually, that, that's really, really helpful because when I was reading, uh, when I have been reading uh, over the last few days, you, you're, you mentioned uh, that some of the things uh, are actually contradictory in the book. Mm. I, I, when I sat down to read, I was kind of thinking about it like, okay, this is sort of going to be like a guide to uh, like, you know, like a way of thinking. I was imagining no. something like uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations uh, where he's, mm. it's just, you know, like a collection of, you know, like, I guess we could imagine it as like, you know, tweets <laughs> from like a Roman emperor, you know, about no. how to live your life. I thought this book was kind of going to be something similar to that. Like, here's, you know, here's our suggestions. But like, um, to go back to the earlier example, you have like in one portion, this profile of Beethoven and, Beethoven and Tchaikovsky uh, and their creative approach presented. And then, you know, like they're these prolific, you know, uh, classical and romantic era composers. And then in the next chapter, it's a, a comparison of jazz and classical and it's saying, uh, be more jazz and more improvisational. <laughs> not so classical and I was like what <laughs> so I understand now that like the uh, the the no. they're not all meant to go together but rather they're to be uh, kind of taken as you like I suppose yeah. if that's the correct okay um then I wanted to uh kind of this is going to continue on into sort of the next line of question that I have who do you think should read this book? Who did, who's like the ideal person that you had in mind when you were preparing mm. this book with Sean? Like, was there a person that you had in mind that you thought to yourself, like, I really hope that this person picks it up and reads it and takes something yeah. from it? It's difficult to say because in a way the book is so applicable to everyone. But I mean, from a marketing perspective, it's terrible if you aim for everyone. So you kind of have to have some person in mind. Yeah. I mean, we all worked in software startups. John is based in the US and Austin, but he's also worked a lot in Silicon Valley. He was a VC, so he's worked very closely with a lot of startups there. Mm-hmm. And those kind of driven, uh, but busy and not necessarily productive people, they are definitely a key group we're aiming for. Also, who we really hope to reach um, 
but it's not going to be the easiest are really leaders uh, and HR people Mm -hmm. because they're the ones who can actually make a difference to their company culture. And I really believe like in the future of work, I mean, I'm working in AI. AI is going to take over more and more of the busy work. You're not going to out busy AI and automation. So if you pride yourself in your busy work, well, you might want to reconsider that. And that's actually what I was sort of like getting to with the jazz and classical as well. Classical to some extent is very rule-based which is something AI is very, very good at. Um, There's very strict patterns. There's very clear rules. And those are the things that AI is going to take over soon. So you should really focus on the more free things, more creative things, and really connecting the larger dots, looking outside of the common patterns. And we really believe that companies who take this seriously, they will be the ones that are going to benefit and thrive in the future. It's really those things like creativity and also empathy is a huge thing, like this human to human interaction. AI is not going to replace that anytime soon. And also those are exactly the things um, where time off is super important, like in the creative pursuit. You need this downtime. You need this incubation. That's where the biggest ideas come from. Mm -hmm. Also for empathy, you need, like, if you stressed out, if you didn't sleep enough, you're a terrible leader. You don't understand other people's emotion. Um, So really to be good at this empathy and empathetic skills, you need to be well rested. Sure. So sure, we want to reach like everyone individually, ideally. And I'm sure everyone to some extent can take something useful from the book. Mm -hmm. But who we really hope to reach are leaders and people who actually have an influence in other people's lives. I see. Okay. So then another another key question that I wanted to talk to you about Mm -hmm. uh, in this discussion, like, uh, is also what's kind of the response that you have to someone who might see the uh, the whole concept as sort of a luxury. Like if I'm, you know, for example, like a super busy student that doesn't have, you know, like a really flexible schedule yeah. and time off for me is precious. Or if I'm like, I don't know, like a single parent that's working a few jobs yeah. to, to make, you know, my life work. How do I, how do I even begin to conceptualize, mm. uh, you know, a, a day off in which I get to do something that also benefits me. Why, why is it bad to just sit on the sofa and watch Netflix? You know, like what if I can't go to a, a, a tiny, a tiny Island in Greece and, and write my sure. PhD in six weeks? Like what's kind of, what do you have like a response for that kind of person? It's like, there's no way that I can apply this to my life. Absolutely. But it totally depends on the particular kind of person. So you first mentioned a student who's crazy busy and, yeah. That person, I would first ask to actually sit down and really ask themselves, is your hard work actually working? Because I think people who just feel busy, once they actually start to evaluate what their business is achieving, probably it's just a perception issue. And on the busiest days, you rarely feel the most accomplished, right? Those days just wash past you and actually don't get all that much done. It's really the days where you took a step back but those are the days where you really have big breakthroughs and also big ideas and also for learning time off is extremely important sleep is extremely important and you actually need those down times for the material to really sink in so that person i would give a very different approach for them i would actually just say hey reevaluate what's actually going on and take a good look if your busyness is actually getting you the results you want mm-hmm. The parent, of course, that's a very, very different matter. And again, there's so many different approaches in the book and not everything is for everyone. Like not everyone can take a half year sabbatical or like go to a Greek island. Although with the Greek island, actually, from a money perspective, I rented a beautiful house on a tiny Greek island, but I actually paid less money than I was paying in my 19 square meter flat in London in the middle of nowhere, which took me like an hour to get into the city. Oh, really? (laughs) People often think about the money excuse. And yes, Mm -hmm. it is to some extent true, but... Mm -hmm. Also, again, you might re- want to reevaluate this and just see how expensive things actually are compared that to is, what you're That is doing. true. Every once in a while, you will be surprised to find that like yeah. A is surprisingly cheaper than B. That is true. That's fair. Totally. Mm-hmm. But also, I mean, there's just so many small micro habits, really. I don't know if you've gotten that far. I think it's reasonably towards the end of the book. There's a profile not. on Hermann Hesse. Uh, he was a German novelist, poet, wrote some really beautiful books. Siddhartha is one of my favorite novels. And he talks all about finding time off in the little joys in life. So he says something like um, someone who for the first time on his way to work picks up a flower and just puts that on his desk has made a huge step towards joy in life. And basically we 
picked up this, what he recommends as time off microdosing. Okay. So first start finding the joys in the little things in life. And he even says, if you can't enjoy these things, you're not going to get much out of much bigger things. Like mm -hmm. we might want to have that one month adventure holiday, but if you don't know how to appreciate those small things, even that long vacation might actually just leave you even more empty afterwards in a way mm -hmm. and he had this beautiful it's a very long quote in the book um, but just to vaguely summarize so he said it actually takes courage to miss a theater premiere and uh, not always read the newest publication and you could say the same about netflix today like it oh, takes really? courage not to watch the first episode of whatever the day is launched mm -hmm. and to just instead enjoy some time in silence and solitude right mm -hmm. but once you practice these things you realize afterwards that all like your life is just filled with so much more little joys and there's these niches of time off everyone can find but sure it's not that easy for a parent who right. works three jobs and really just wants to have some downtime and sure again some of the profiles in the book really talk about saving energy for your time off and i, I totally understand that it's very difficult for a person like that to save energy right for time off Right, right. But yeah, that's a that's maybe a, a spot to start then is finding finding these <clears throat> small moments to yeah. appreciate. And the point about uh yeah, choosing to uh forego, you know, the big production, mm. you know, like so much of our lives, you know, or at least our lives up until recently has been kind of, you know, uh FOMO, <laughs> FOMO, fear of missing out is lingering around totally. everything when we yeah. open our Instagrams or our Facebooks or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, choosing to let go of that is is an interesting uh, that's actually exactly what we yeah. say in his profile we recommend jomo the joy of missing out <laughs> that's kind of funny uh, i like that okay but, but this actually uh to bring it back to um where where we are situated now then uh in tokyo japan what do you think are maybe like the cross-cultural applications of something like this like we're mm. We and we have both uh, worked uh, in Japan in Japanese uh, organizations and have, in this discussion, already described some of the challenges that we've encountered there, uh, that are you know indicative of maybe an incompatibility with a certain personality type or a certain culture. Yeah. So, do you think that this this concept, like if I'm a Japanese person that reads this book and I'm like, this is a great idea, I think that these are really really important, and I take it to yeah. HR and they're like, yeah, no, <laughs> like what what do you think? Kind of you know how how could this be applied cross culturally, if at all? Totally. I'm sure it can be applied, um, but yeah, it has to be taken in a different way. So actually, in my, well, still current company, uh, the creativity one, Cosmo, we actually share an office and are somewhat working together with a team from Dentsu. And Dentsu is very well known for, well, not having the best work-life balance necessarily. That is correct, yes. And at an internal event, actually, uh, we, we had this nice, we call it Hanamoku. So Hanakin is like the TGIF equivalent here, but we mm -hmm. did it on the first day. And it's just nice get together. People talk about random subjects they care about. There's free craft beer. Um, and one day I talked about, well, my ideas around time off and mm -hmm. people were, this is amazing, but people can do this. People can take, like they were, they were almost shocked. Like <laughs> those mm -hmm. ideas seemed so foreign to them in a way. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I, I think it's tricky, but it's very needed. And also the very last profile in the book is actually on two Japanese work-life balance consultants. Mm -hmm. So Yoshie Komuro and Sarah Rai. Um, they've been running this company for almost 10 years now and really going into bigger companies and teaching them how to have a better work-life balance. And they start mm -hmm. with really simple things. Like it's putting a little footer in your email saying, hey, uh, sorry, we don't reply after, I don't know, 10 p.m. in the evening. We'll get back mm -hmm. to you tomorrow. Like Japanese people need to be told that that's something you can do, right? That you don't have to reply to an email at 2 a.m. And there's these little things that you can start from even here in Japan. And Japan has the manufacturing of stuff really, really nailed down. Japan is very, very good. It was very good at that traditionally. And we're still sort of riding on that wave, all, even though it's more and more kind of fading away but if you look at knowledge work there is basically no other country in the world that's less efficient in terms of knowledge work people working crazy hours but so little stuff is actually getting done in the knowledge work sector yeah. and i think that's like if japan wants to fix its problems which are getting more and more real as we see especially right now mm. i think they really really have to rethink the way knowledge work is approached yeah, that's it's a very this this is a topic that I'm sure uh, there is worth a, a discussion of its own. Uh, but that's a 
it's, I guess it, it goes back to uh, the, the value of a worker uh, in, in a mm. Japanese organization is in many, I shouldn't say all because there are some like, you know, smaller startups yeah. and smaller yeah. groups that are working together now that have a different corporate culture. But the value of a worker is like whether their body is in their seat at a time that is assigned yeah. to them or not. And it's like, even if you don't have anything to do, you're ready to go. Like you're showing that you are ready to, you know, be on, you're like on call at all times for your employer. No. And that's, uh, that's, but I think it's so hard to address because it's, this is a, hundreds of years of, of culture coming together to, to make this work culture. You know, it's not so easy to break though. Uh, just, I mean, from seeing anecdotal comments mm. here and there on the internet, lots of people do want to break it. You know, people yep. do want to yep. be able to, uh, to have a different, uh, a different work-life balance and to approach their work differently, but within a system that's uh, very rigid, it's extremely hard to do so. Like to go back to I think the, also, mm, sorry. Uh, I, like you mentioned this discussion, uh, actually, uh, in your current company. And I'm like really like pleasantly surprised to hear that that's a thing. When I spoke to uh, the guy I referenced earlier, Jan, uh, he talked about um, in his uh, architecture office that he worked in briefly, like he wanted to have a discussion about something his team was working on. And after the discussion, like he organized the discussion and made it happen. He kind of pulled his coworkers and said, what did you think? You know, like, did you learn anything? What did you take away from this? And they said, well, it was very interesting, but they felt that it was a waste of time. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. Like it's just yeah, a totally different way of approaching things. Like, no. you know, getting these different no. perspectives uh, is considered for some people, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say all, uh, just, you know, a waste of time. Whereas, no. I mean, I could, I, that just, that comment has obviously stuck with me now for like more than two years, <laughs> but, uh, I think that that's a very interesting challenge that doesn't mm. have like a quick solution. Even no. we've seen, uh, uh, Japan having to quickly adjust specifically Tokyo, uh, quickly adjust yeah, totally. in two months now to a work from home approach. And many of, it seems, places were kind of paralyzed by this. Like mm. I saw, um, I saw the Nikkei reporting that, uh, uh, applications for uh, new online banking accounts mm. had like had gone up by three times. I believe that was in mm. March. Like there are these tiny little things that Japan has been forced to address uh, in yeah. the last two months. It's quite interesting to see actually, because these are things that like many other countries have, just, they're just, they've just been normal in many other countries. Totally. But I think that like, this is now a very interesting time for a discussion like the one uh, that's presented in your book, because it no. kind of, people are allowed the opportunity maybe to consider these kinds mm. of topics and they wouldn't have been able to consider them before. Mm. So Absolutely. It's going to be very interesting to see how the whole thing turns out long-term. If Japan is going to go just completely back to normal or if they actually manage to learn some lessons from it and really use that to speed things up in the right kind of direction. It's quite interesting. And I mean, I think it applies to other countries as well, for sure. Mm. You know, no, like no. there's so much work that can be done from home, but like, you know, no we just haven't done it <laughs> so no. it's interesting uh, but I wanted to kind of I mean we've been sort of I guess heavy on the the Japan criticism here perhaps but so I wanted to kind of move it in like a more positive direction as we kind of near the end of our discussion today what have you found that's joyful or especially exciting about working in mm. Japan or you know you've described uh, London or even spending time in Greece as well too what have you found no. joyful about those experiences so many different, I mean, first of all, just getting into a new environment. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a chapter on travel in the book as well, which talks mm -hmm. actually a lot about, again, creativity, just by putting yourself into a new environment. And that can even be your own neighborhood if you just use the eyes of a traveler. Mm -hmm. But just getting that change of scenery, it completely makes you rethink so many things you've taken for granted. Mm -hmm. And I think that sparks a lot of creative insights as well. I see. But I guess Japan in general, I mean, there's so many things that are joyful. Yes, I complain a lot about Japan, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here and if I wouldn't be enjoying it anymore I wouldn't be here anymore so, right that's true um, yeah. I guess well I'm personally I'm very bad at moderation I guess I'm quite intense in some ways I started writing three years ago and now I just published a book uh -huh. I got into running I don't know 10 years ago and a couple of years after that I started running ultra marathons oh my gosh. Um, I like partying and if I party I party pretty hard and <laughs> I'm not very good at moderation <laughs> so I think okay. Japan also in a way has that it's a whole shokunin culture i mean 
it's kind of funny because some of the things I really love about Japan are also then in a way very directly linked to the problems we just talked about. Uh, But it's this really strong dedication to something. And if you're mm -hmm. into something, you really give it absolutely everything. You really get into it. Like if you care about a type of food, you dedicate your entire life to just that one ingredient or something. Yep. I think every um, single person I've spoken to interviewed from Japan <laughs> has had that comment. I think right. I think now, yes, everybody yeah. has said that exact same thing. Uh, I think that's a really big thing. And also, I mean, I'm into music. I really love the underground music scene. And again, it's really, it's just such tiny communities, but they're so deep into whatever they're into. Mm. And I think a lot of foreigners have that experience. Um, the first time they come to Japan, either they're super lucky like me and meet the right kind of people who introduce use them to these scenes mm-hmm. or they never even know they exist and have a very miserable time here in Japan. Yeah. Actually, like all the foreigners you talk to, they fall into one of those two categories. I find. <laughs> okay. I got to think about that one. Actually. I <laughs> think about that. <laughs> two categories of foreigner. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, maybe a bit extreme, but I, I know, I know it's kind of yeah. joking around. Uh, okay. So then uh, if I'm, if I'm a person that's thinking about, um, you know, getting into, well, you have many different, you know, uh, kind of facets uh, to your work. Uh, if I'm a person that's thinking about traveling abroad to work on a mm. creative project, or if I'm thinking yeah. about taking some of the lessons from your book, do you have any advice? Is there something that you should definitely do or something you should definitely not do from your experience? In the context of travel? Uh, in the context, yes, of, of traveling or going going to another place uh, mm. or, or using another mm. language in pursuit yeah. of doing something yeah, creative. Yeah. Mm. In terms of travel, I think, uh, getting yourself into a new place. I mean, sure, maybe the first day, look at all the famous sites and kind of do that. Mm -hmm. But also just slow down your travel and don't feel like you need to see everything um, because in the end you end up seeing pretty much nothing if you approach it that way. If I go to a new city, there's two things I like to do. I, I mean, I'm a runner, not so much anymore, but still like one of the first things I like to do is just run. Mm -hmm. in that city because it gives you a completely different perspective and also i love coffee and i I literally spend more time working in coffee shops than in an office or something so when i go to a new city i always like i mean it sounds stupid but i actually work there um and the first thing i do is i just go into a coffee shop and spend an hour there working but it gives you a very clear sense of the city in a way and like every city has or every place has these different well it's a very different culture and i think in that way if you just immerse yourself in the local culture you get something completely different out of it and you actually experience the culture even instead of going to a restaurant if you have a kitchen or something go to a supermarket go to a market like explore these things stuff that looks completely normal to the locals will suddenly spark these crazy creative ideas in you and yeah it'll just be an amazing experience uh so yeah try and approach uh life kind of there as a local even if you only have a little bit of time maybe just do a few less sites and try and just immerse yourself in a slower lifestyle Mm. and then also when you get back home try and bring this traveler's eye back into your own area like even if you're out on a walk take a different route from what you normally do and try and cultivate that mindset because suddenly you can find amazing things and amazing ideas even in your neighborhood Mm -hmm. right Mm-hmm. So just I by kind of applying my... that okay yeah. okay so just but just by applying that you know that willingness to kind of as you describe in the book you know take a take a road that you've never taken before just, for example mm, keeping that kind of mindset active yeah. even when i mean it's back. difficult um sure but yeah just it's a bit about being well conscious about it really just yeah. reflecting on it no yeah Great. I think, but I think that that's really good advice that, I mean, even if we're not obviously able to travel at this point in right, time, maybe exactly. there, maybe that's one small lesson that we can all take away. I don't know if you had the same experience, but I actually heard that from several people now because, well, the only thing you can do outside is kind of go for walks. I had mm. so many people tell me I experienced, like I found areas close to me that I never knew existed. Just I've because heard that too. The standard routes get boring, so you take a different turn and whoa, there's like this new park there suddenly. Yeah, so, oh, I never saw that coffee shop before, yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. So woohoo, there's all kinds of stuff to find just in our neighborhood, totally. I suppose. No. Great. We are coming to the end of our time together, so I want to make sure uh, our listeners uh, and viewers can find you and find your book. Where can we find you online and where can we find your book? 
The book, uh, you can find it on Amazon. That's probably the easiest. It should also be available on all other major retailers. But yeah, yeah just go for Amazon. Go to Amazon. It also helps us with the rankings in the system. I see. Uh, the title is Time Off, A Practical Guide to Building Your Rest Ethic and Finding Success Without the Stress. It's available as Kindle and uh, and paperback. I think you picked up the Kindle version, I right? I did. I have the Kindle version. I have been reading it uh, on my Sweet. iPhone. Yes, it's Although I would right actually now. recommend people picking up the paperback. And I actually make less money on the paperback just to give that also. But um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful book. Actually, you should interview Maria Suzuki. She's the illustrator we have on the book. And mm -hmm. I don't know if people can see it, but that's the book. And nice. it's full of amazing illustrations. Yeah, each chapter has a really cool hand-drawn illustration uh, of the person totally. being profiled. Mm. Yeah, there's many profiles in the book. And yes, it's nice on the ebook, but it just can't compete with the beauty of the paperback so actually really in any other it. situation i would have picked up i would have picked up the, the <laughs> physical book but i was like i am going to talk to this person this week and i really want to make sure right, that right, i have right. had a chance to read it and i have it now so that's why i went well to... thanks for picking it up anyway yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and i'll continue reading it great so and where can, can find we find it. you yeah, exactly yeah. um me on my website uh maxfrenzel.com that's okay. probably the easiest place mm -hmm. also if you're interested in my more other stuff like music i bake bread all these kind of random things mm -hmm. uh, my instagram mf frenzel that should be a good place to start gotcha. okay i will put all of these links uh in awesome. the youtube description and in the podcast description uh and on the project website so if anyone out there listening or watching wants to get anything that we've talked about today or find you that is where to do it so i will end today but if you have if you would like to end with any comments now is your chance <laughs> if you have any uh, final thoughts putting me on the spot <laughs> well most no, people just well, say no <laughs> that's fine actually too. i do have something to say um, okay. depending on when people watch this or mm -hmm. listen to this now it's really a special time i mean it's a difficult time for a lot of people but i think the people who struggle the most right now are those who don't really have a meaningful time off practice who don't have meaningful side projects at the same time right now we're seeing so many people who do amazing work because they finally use that time to well, write that book or produce that album or even make that business plan so think in your own life like what can you use that time for right now because if you use it right it can be an amazing opportunity right now mm -hmm. absolutely <laughs> wonderful thought to end on thank you very much for your time thanks great to connect with you Thanks so much for watching this episode of Non-Native Creative. If you liked this episode, please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Feel free to leave comments about this episode in the comments section too. Please make sure to stop by the project Patreon at patreon.com slash non-native creative. Patrons can get access to Patreon-only discussions, bonus behind-the-scenes media, interview transcripts, and access to patron-only live streams. Your support will help make sure the series can continue to share exciting, interesting stories from creative people working across borders. Thanks again for watching. See you next week.